All right, so it, so it's a you know a great pleasure to have the opportunity to be here to talk about the subject. So thank you. I thank very much the organizers. Uh, um, okay, so so my title it should have said introduction to so wall crossing in in, uh, um, in physics and some application to uh, to differential equations. Um, so so in the last uh, in the last few years, maybe the last five years or so. Um, uh, there's been a big resurgence of interest in this uh, problem of wall crossing. So I'll tell you what it is in just a moment. But uh, but the funny thing is, when you first hear about it, um, this wall crossing sounds like something that you would really rather not think about. It's kind of a it's kind of an annoying detail that's messing up whatever you were trying to do. You 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 had some quantity which uh, you were say you were trying to count something. You were trying to count volume minimizing cycles in Calabi Yau three folds, or in physics you were trying to count some supersymmetric particles. And you thought it was going to be invariant. You thought it wasn't going to depend on parameters at all. Um, and then when you look closely, when you try to get all the details right, you discover that, ah, there's a little problem. Um, the thing is not quite invariant. Um, when you vary the parameters of your system, um, the thing is kind of piecewise constant. But there's some critical moments where it might jump. So, so rather than having a thing that's just globally invariant, you wind up with a thing that has this kind of piecewise constant uh, dependence on parameters. Um, and so it sounds like something that you would rather ignore. You hope that someone else will come up with a better invariant that doesn't have this problem. Um, uh, but uh, but it seems that that's kind of the wrong point of view. So so this this phenomenon this phenomenon of uh, uh, the jumping of invariants, um, which shows up in a lot of contexts, it turned out to have a kind of rich sort of inner structure to it. Um, uh, which turned out to be connected to a lot of subjects. So it, so it showed up in quantum field theory. But on the other hand, it's, it's it somehow shows up also in neurosymmetry, in hyperkähler geometry, integrable systems, cluster algebras. Uh, um, and important for us today, the theory of, uh, um, the theory of differential equations. Um, In Donaldson theory, okay, yes. Uh, in Donaldson theory, there's also this the general phenomenon of wall crossing, um, but here I'm talking about a particular kind of wall crossing. So yeah, so here I'm talking about this particular BPS wall crossing, which is somehow not the same as the wall crossing in Donaldson theory. At least uh, I haven't heard of any connection between uh, uh, between the two. So that's why I don't put that here. Um, uh, uh, okay, so 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 my main goal today is to talk about some relatively simple examples of the wall crossing phenomenon, the ones that are somehow connected to the Hitchens system, um, and to explain how they're related, in particular, to uh, um, to differential equations. Um, so this is part of you know to the extent that I say anything original in this talk, it's part of uh, a long-running joint work with uh, Davide Gatto and and, uh, and Greg Moore. Um, so that'll be ultimately a pure mathematics story, but let me start by describing um, what the problem of wall crossing is, uh, actually from the point of view of physics. Uh, okay. um, so suppose we have a, some physical system, and suppose that it's something which, if you look at it from a long way away, it would look like just a particle. So maybe it's like an atomic nucleus, but when you look a long way away, you don't see the inner structure, you just see a particle. Um, so one of the basic questions you might ask about that thing is, you know, is it stable or unstable? Um, will it live forever, or will it eventually decay into some more uh, basic constituents? Um, well, uh, the answer uh, might depend on the uh, parameters of the system. So for example, um, you could imagine taking this particle and putting it in a box full of other particles. And then you could change the density uh, um, of other particles in that box. Um, or if you're more ambitious, you know, if, you, if you're a high energy theorist, you might imagine um, that you can even vary the kind of fundamental constants of the universe. Um, you could change the quark masses or the coupling of the, uh, all the interactions. And maybe the question of whether some particular atomic nucleus is stable will depend on the, the answer to that question. Um, so, so, you know, so as you vary the parameters, there might be some locus in the parameter space um, where the particle changes. It changes from being stable to unstable or the other way. Um, and so those loci, you know, they're Evidently, they're of real co-dimension one in the whole parameter space, and so let me call them the walls. Um, so on one side of the wall, the thing's stable. Um, well, no, there are some things that are there are some things that are really absolutely stable. Um, you know, for example, if you have the lightest the lightest particle that's carrying a given charge, um, that particle really cannot decay even in infinite time. Um, yeah, for example, an electron. Um, 
But that's actually a good example. So if, if the electron is the electron is is stable, but if we would change the parameters so that some other particle carrying the the same charge as the electron became lighter than the electron, then it would become possible for the electron to decay into that other particle. So that's a quite good example of this uh, um, of this kind of phenomenon. Um, and we'll be studying some very special field theories for which there really is a notion of absolutely stable particle. Um, okay. Uh, um, so in general, we might be interested in a. Oh, this is not. Is this yes no function? It's not a real value function. Of course, yes no function. Every everywhere there are crosses. I answer yes or no. Yeah. Like the point is where a real value function is definite values, which is, this is not an example. Uh, a real world crossing. I mean, have a function a priori real value function, and this jumps. If right. the function yes no, it's always like that. Yeah. Well, take the function to be one if the. No, no, but, no, but this is cheating. Yeah? I, I, I call it pi. We should discuss the actual function. Discuss the <laughs> objects. Yes. Right? So, and it's okay. not real value function. I mean, just language is our language, yes no language. It's cheating. Yeah? It just, yeah, yeah. Something the, your, the language has war crossing, not the physical system. You call it yes or no, you no, call no, it one no, zero. No, physical system is a symmetrical physical system, not actual physical system. So no, 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 it's just notation. It's just a matter of notation. It's not okay. mathematics. When you call this number, yes, you call one, or no, call zero. But this notation is just language. Come on, it's not mathematics. But there could be some questions which the answer changes. Well, they gave a show. For example, I just want to show. Just in linguistic, what you call black or white? What do you call, yeah? Pile yeah. or not a pile? I mean, Let's see the example. Let's see this. Okay. Um, yeah, maybe maybe the sort of mathematical instantiation instantiation of this you'll like better. Um, uh, but so 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 in general, um, uh, we may have uh, um, in a single physical system we might have many different uh, species of particle, and we'd like to study all of them simultaneously. Um, and so correspondingly, there might be many different walls in our parameter space across which something happens. So here one particle decays, here another particle decays, and so on. Um, and so the kind of question you'd like to understand is, first of all, where in your parameter space are the walls? And second, you know, imagine I look at the set of all sort of absolutely stable particles, and you could ask how that set changes when you move from one side of the wall to the other side. So concretely, imagine that you knew all the stable particles on one side of a wall, and you try to determine what are going to be all the stable particles on the other side. Um, that's the question we'd like to understand. Now, today, this problem is really too hard to solve exactly. Well, can you give like, a, a really convincing example? Yeah? Because not to this, it's like what you call any uh, man, or what is an ape, you know? And the reason no, people no, say this is no, not... It's not biology. It's here, it's here the notion of limit. It's kind of a question about large volume limit. And no, but it's yes, no. It's, 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 it's not number. No, no, no. It's 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 a symmetrical approximation. You go to infinite... No, no, but it's a number. You say, you say it's, it is an invariant. I'm going to make a number momentarily. Um, uh, I'll make a number momentarily, and then tell me if that number is satisfactory. So, so, uh, um, so, so the problem that, as I formulated it so far, is actually uh, is too hard to solve exactly for most um, sort of physically realistic systems. Um, on the other hand, there are some kind of toy examples where it, it has been possible to do uh, to do much better, and those are systems where the underlying laws of nature are somehow very special. They're so-called supersymmetric. Um, and these, these supersymmetric models, um, superficially, you first think they're more complicated. You take, uh, take uh, your particles and add, roughly speaking, one new particle for every old particle. Um, they're sort of superficially more complicated, but actually they turn out to be much, much more nicely behaved um, uh, than a sort of random arbitrary system. So you should think of the differences somehow like the difference between real analysis and complex analysis. So in complex analysis, you throw in, uh, you sort of double everything. You make all your uh, numbers complex. But that actually makes the story much, much simpler. Um, and in these kind of systems, there's a, there's a kind of privileged class of absolutely stable particles, the so-called BPS particles. Um, and by restricting our attention to those, we get a problem that we have a chance of actually solving. Um, so, so a little more precisely, you know, suppose I have any quantum system, say a quantum field theory that describes uh, um, the physics in our universe or some, or some other fictional universe. Um, so then uh, uh, um, this quantum system should have a Hilbert space. And in particular, we could focus on the Hilbert space of just um, uh, the subspace inside that Hilbert space consisting of just the one particle states. Um, and so it's graded by some lattice, um, the lattice of global charges in the theory. So you can think of, for example, electromagnetism. Then this gamma will be literally a, a, a rank two lattice 
um, just parameterizing the electric and magnetic charge of any given particle. So we have a Hilbert space, and it's divided up into, um, uh, into, these, uh, into these pieces. Um, and so for a, for a sort of random physical system, each of these things would be a representation of just the Poincaré algebra, just the isometries of space-time. Um, if it's supersymmetric, it's a representation of something a little bigger, what we call super Poincaré algebra. Um, and then what one defines, one defines an integer number. So for every one of these Hilbert spaces, one defines an integer number, which you can think of roughly as being just a, um, a graded version of the, of the dimension. Um, but a little more precisely, it's not exactly the dimension, but rather you have this, uh, this H gamma, you decompose it under the super Poincaré algebra, and you keep track of the number of times that some special small representations occur. So roughly it's the dimension, but it's not precisely the dimension. It's something a little fancier. Um, so then we can formulate a question. So now the question becomes, so all the particles which sit in these small representations, they have in particular the property of being absolutely stable. Um, and so now you can ask, um, suppose now that I vary the parameters of my supersymmetric system, how does this collection of integers, um, how does this collection of integers change? Um, okay. Uh, so that's the kind of, that's the kind of problem that, uh, um, that arises in physics that we would like to be able to solve. So what exactly stable do you mean in mathematical language here? You'll see. Um, yeah, I think maybe you won't be satisfied until I translate to the, until I show you the actual mathematical example. So, so um, I'll come on to that. Um, uh, so this problem, so the first cases where this problem was solved were uh, systems in just two space-time dimensions. They were studied in like the early 1990s by Chakotay and Vafa. And in that case, they gave sort of the most perfect possible solution of the problem. They had a formula which tells you if you know all the particles on one side, um, what will be the particles on the other side. Um, uh, in four dimensions, um, so which is somehow the more physically interesting case, um, the problem also is, is much, much harder. Um, so it was solved um, in a few isolated examples. In particular, in 1995, Simon and Witten solved this problem in the case of one very specific gauge theory. Um, this so-called pure n equals two super Yang Mills theory, um, uh, and what they found was um, that in this theory, so in this theory you have a parameter space which is just a one-dimensional, um, one complex dimensional space. Um, there was one wall. Inside of the wall there were exactly two distinct stable particles. Outside of the wall there was this infinite, uh, uh, infinite family of them, um, and uh, so. After that, uh, you know, further progress was made just in some specific examples. Um, but to solve the problem in complete generality um, uh, seemed just, uh, um, just hopelessly out of reach. Um, but uh, so fortunately, the, the sort of inspiration for all the new progress in this subject is that mathematicians kind of came to the rescue here. So, so they formulated a theory of um, uh, the theory of generalized Donaldson-Thomas invariants, they're defined in a, uh, in a uh, totally geometric way. Um, and in many particular physical systems, um, you, can formulate, uh, uh, you can formulate their generalized Donaldson-Thomas invariants, and they seem to be exactly these omega of gamma. So exactly the quantities which we wanted to study in physics, um, uh, um, the same quantities uh, were studied by, uh, um, by mathematicians. Particularly in the work of Kinsevich Soibelman and Joyce and Song, um, they found a totally general solution to this problem of, of wall crossing. Um, okay, so now, um, so now I want to um, uh, switch essentially from physics to mathematics. So um, I want to show you a few actual concrete examples of this wall crossing phenomenon um, and of the wall crossing formula that Kinsevich and Soibelman uh, wrote down. Um, so, so let's fix some data. So let's fix um, a Lie algebra uh, of ADE type, um, and let's fix a compact Riemann surface uh, that we draw there um, with a bunch of marked points on it. Um, so for every such choice, for every choice of an ADE Lie algebra and a curve with marked points, um, there is actually a corresponding uh, uh, four-dimensional quantum field theory. Um, and in that particular quantum field theory, the questions which I so far described to you in a kind of uh, airy physical way, um, the questions, particularly questions about these quantities omega of gamma, become now completely concrete and uh, uh, geometric questions. Um, so, 
So OK, and so and let me specialize a little further. Um, let me specialize to the case where the Lie algebra G is a, is a1, in other words, uh, uh, SU2. Um, and so we're going to do a construction. And the construction um, uh, is going to involve uh, meromorphic quadratic differentials on the curve. So what's a meromorphic quadratic differential? It's just a thing which, so thing phi 2 of z, which locally, in terms of some local coordinate z on the curve, is represented just as uh, f of z dz squared. So some meromorphic function times uh, dz squared. Um, so if I fix the, if I fix the singularities, so they're, they're meromorphic. They're going to have singularities exactly at the points zi that I marked. Um, and if I fix the, if I fix the, um, uh, the order of the singularity at each of those marked points, then there's some finite dimensional space of these meromorphic quadratic differentials, and that's going to be my parameter space. Um, okay. So what are we going to do with these quadratic differentials? Um, well, okay. So so given one of these quadratic differentials. Um, uh, and given also uh, a phase, um, there's an induced uh, uh, foliation of the curve. So what is that foliation? So I take <coughs> it's easiest to describe it just to describe what it looks like in local coordinates. Um, so we had our thing, which was f of z dz squared. Um, locally, at least away from the zeros of this quadratic differential, away, sorry, away from the zeros and the poles, um, I could find a local coordinate w where I just absorb this f of z into the definition of w. So w is like the integral of uh, uh, square root of f of z. Um, uh, so find a local coordinate in which your quadratic differential just looks like dw squared. Um, and then in that local coordinate, um, it's easy to say what this foliation is. You just take the foliation by, by straight lines. Uh, well, which straight lines? There's a choice of what angle to take the straight lines. So that's this, this parameter theta. So the leaves will be just straight lines. Um, whose inclination is theta in the w coordinate. OK. So theta or theta over 2? Because theta plus pi, or um, theta to theta plus pi, it's. Uh, I think I want really. I think I want really theta. Um, so indeed, so, so oh, very good. So, so indeed, um, the foliation. Um, uh, oh. Um, Uh, I, um, I guess the, the way that I've written it here, um, yeah, sorry, the way that I've written it here is slightly ambiguous because I could always change w to w, w to minus w without changing this. Uh, um, uh, so yeah, we could write it a little more precisely to deal even with that ambiguity. But for now, let me just say, say this. Um, all right. Um, so what does this foliation look like? Um, uh, well, as I said, away from the zeros and the poles is just a regular foliation. Um, at the zeros and the poles um, of this quadratic differential, um, uh, we have uh, the foliation has some singularities. Um, so let me describe, for example, what happens, at, uh, what happens at a double pole, which is somehow the most basic case to understand. Um, at a double pole, if you just um, uh, uh, you know, work out the local behavior of the trajectories around that pole, um, what you find is that the trajectories tend to uh, spiral in. And the, the exact way that they spiral in depends on the, uh, um, the relationship between this uh, parameter m, which is the residue, um, and the, uh, the parameter theta, which was defining the foliation. Um, but anyway, except in some exceptional case, um, the trajectories are always kind of spiraling into these uh, poles. Um, and for, te for a sort of technical convenience from now on, I'm always going to assume that, uh, um, that, the, uh, that my quadratic differentials have at least one pole, which is double or maybe higher order. Um, if it's higher order, it still attracts the trajectories just in a slightly different way. Um, so and what's useful about that is that uh, it kind of controls the global behavior of this foliation. So if you think of the way I define this foliation, in general, you might think that the, tra the, the trajectories behave in a very crazy way, that they, uh, um, they move like ergodically around the, the surface. Um, and in the case where we have these poles, that won't happen. Um, uh, as long as this parameter theta is generic, um, what will happen is that every trajectory is a, uh, has at least one end on a pole. So it's eventually attracted, uh, roughly, when it comes close enough to one of these poles, it'll be attracted and fall in. Um, and so for that, we use some, uh, um, uh, fortunately, uh, Strebel studied in great detail the trajectories of quadratic differentials. Um, and from his results, you get, uh, you get this nice fact. 
Um, so okay, so that's what happens. So that's what happens at the uh, um, at the poles. Um, and on the other hand, you also have singularities at the zeros of the quadratic differential. Um, and at the simple zeros, um, uh, if you work out the local behavior around a simple zero, you find a singularity which is just a three-pronged uh, uh, singularity. Um, so I'll mark the simple zeros always with this cross. Um, and so let me assume uh, uh, for now, in, in fact, actually, I think throughout this talk, um, let me assume that the zeros are only simple zeros. So for the generic quadratic differential, you only have simple zeros. Um, and so then we have, for every simple zero, we have these three distinguished trajectories, um, the ones which go right into the zero. Um, and uh, so I'm going to focus, in the construction I'm going to tell you, we actually essentially don't use the, the generic trajectories at all. We only use the trajectories that are coming out of the zeros. Um, and so for every zero, we have these three things coming out. Let's take the, the union of all those trajectories. Um, I'll call that the, the, the spectral network. Um, in this case, uh, it also has another name. It's called the critical graph of the, um, of the quadratic differential. Um, so I'll write it W of uh, phi 2 and theta. OK. Um, and so for a generic value of theta, um, what happens? So um, we have these zeros. Um, and each zero is emitting three trajectories. Um, and each of those trajectories travels around the surface in some complicated way and eventually ends up on one of the poles. Um, so, uh, so the picture you get is something like this. Um, the surface gets divided up into, um, into these cells. Um, so at least this is what happens for a generic, um, for a generic value of the face. Okay. Um, and so now what we're going to want to understand is how does this thing vary um, as we vary the parameters, uh, as we vary the quadratic differential, and as we vary this uh, uh, phase parameter, which we're calling theta. Um, so, well, from the way it's constructed, it's, it's reasonably clear that for a small variation of phi 2 and theta, this network is just going to change by, uh, uh, by an isotopy. Um, but as we make a larger variation, um, uh, we may reach some critical place where the topology of the network actually suddenly jumps. Um, so let's see a picture of that. So this is kind of the simplest example of such a jump. So here I'm taking the curve to be CP1, and I'm taking my quadratic differential. So here's a quadratic differential which has a singularity at infinity but nowhere else. Um, and it has two zeros, one at plus one and one at minus one. Um, and what you see, sorry, um, what you see is that as we vary, uh, um, as you vary this parameter theta, so now I'm showing you holding phi 2 fixed and just varying the parameter theta. Um, as you vary that parameter, um, as you vary that parameter, um, the thing, uh, this picture, this critical graph or spectral network, just, just varies by isotopy except at one critical moment. So here, there's one critical moment where right there the topology suddenly changes. So we had two trajectories that were going out here. They suddenly jumped, and then we had two trajectories here instead. Um, so, and if you look at why the, if you look at the moment where the jump happens, um, if you look at the moment where the jump happens, um, uh, sorry, um, what you see is that the jump happens exactly at the moment when something non-generic happens. It's when you have a trajectory which comes out of one zero and goes just straight into the other zero. Um, so that's a kind of special trajectory which occurs just at this critical value of the phase. Um, uh, so, okay, so what are these special trajectories? So I told you that um, for a generic value of the phase, um, every trajectory has you know, at least one end on a pole. You know, it travels, it might start at a zero, but it travels around the surface and eventually ends up on a pole. Um, but, uh, um, but that's only the generic statement. So for some special value of the phase, um, it might happen that it, you have a trajectory which has both ends on a zero. Um, so I'm calling that a special trajectory, and those things come in two flavors. You could have either uh, what we call a saddle connection, which is what we saw in the last picture, just one which travels from one, begins at one zero and ends on another one. Um, or you could have a closed trajectory, so that's a trajectory which um, uh, begins at a zero, travels around, and comes back to the, to the same zero. Um, okay. Uh, so, um, so the the moments when this uh, when this uh, critical graph suddenly jumps 
um, are exactly the moments when one of these special trajectories uh, um, appears. Um, OK, so now we can formulate a question. So, so let's consider the following question. Um, suppose I now fix my quadratic differential, um, and I allow this phase parameter uh, to vary. Um, then you could ask, well, the sort of course question you could ask is, how many sp special trajectories will we see? Um, so I vary theta just from, from, uh, um, from, zero, to, from zero to pi. Um, how many times will this picture jump? How many times will I see a special trajectory up here? Um, OK. Um, well, OK, so let's start thinking about this question. So a first um, very preliminary comment about it is that these special trajectories, they can't occur uh, um, too much. They can only occur at most at countably many phases. Well, why is that? Um, it's because, so as I'll explain in a second, um, they only have countably many possible topologies. Um, and the, and uh, um, the parameter uh, theta where the thing occurs is actually determined by its topology. Um, well, in the following sense. I'm about to say what topology means. Um, but, but yeah, roughly it means exactly the position on the surface. But, but let me measure that a little more precisely. So, um, uh, so, um, so we have this quadratic differential. Um, given a quadratic differential, in particular, there's a sort of canonical double cover of the curve attached to it. Namely, you just take the two square roots of the quadratic differential. So as you move around on the, on the curve, phi 2 of z, you look at the square roots of phi 2 of z. Um, because the thing was a, uh, was a quadratic differential, um, uh, its, uh, its square roots are naturally valued in the cotangent bundle. And so this spectral cover is, um, um, is living inside the cotangent bundle of the curve. Um, and there's a, so there's a sort of obvious 2 to 1 projection that just forgets the square root. Um, and that covering is, of course, branched at the zeros of phi 2. Those are the places where the two square roots come together. So OK, so we have this branched covering, well, really over the complement of the of the poles. Um, never mind the poles for a second. The important thing is that this thing is branched, uh, um, is branched at the zeros. Um, so now uh, um, let's define our lattice gamma um, to be the first homology of, uh, um, of, the, of the spectral curve. Um, so before, in the abstract physics part of the talk, I defined some lattice, which was going to be the lattice of charges, so the thing which kept track of the charges of all the particles in the theory. In this particular theory, the thing that keeps track of the charges is just the first homology of this spectral curve. Um, and now in particular, um, each one of these special trajectories um, canonically can be lifted to a one cycle uh, uh, on the spectral cover. So here's the picture of it for a saddle connection. So if I have a saddle connection here, it's something which exactly runs between two zeros. Um, which are two branch points. So if I just take the union of its two lifts um, up to the cover, um, that becomes actually a closed path uh, on the cover. And there's a way of even determining the orientation. Um, uh, so we get a corresponding homology class. So that homology class is what I'm going to say is measuring the topology of my, uh, um, of my uh, special trajectory. OK. So then, uh, um, uh, so OK, so to every one of these things, I have an associated uh, homology class, or what I'll call a charge. Um, and now, OK, so um, now I come back to this question of um, at what phase will the thing appear? Um, well, once we have one of these, uh, um, uh, once we have a homology class on the cover, we can define the you know, most obvious thing to consider. We have a cover which is sitting inside of the cotangent bundle. The cotangent bundle has this tautological or Leeville one form. Um, and you could just take the integral of that one form around, uh, um, uh, around, the, uh, around the one cycle. Um, well, what is this one form? Concretely, when you evaluate it on the spectral cover, that one form literally is the square root of the quadratic differential. So um, for, for paths which lie on this spectral cover, you would think of this integral as being in, you're integrating the square root of the quadratic differential. Um, or said yet another way, you're integrating, you're looking at the variation of this coordinate, which I called uh, w. Um, and so in particular, if this gamma is not a random homology class, but if it comes as the charge of one of these special trajectories, when I lift that spectral tra trajectory up and compute this integral, what I get is guaranteed to be, it's not a random number, but rather it's valued in, uh, its phase is theta. Um, uh, OK, so. Um, uh, so the, the periods for a special trajectory to occur at a particular phase, um, its period has to have exactly that phase. Um, and now, since there's only countably many uh, homology classes, you know, this equation can be solved only for countably many uh, phases. 
Um, and, and also, you know, if you know what charge you're looking for, um, then the corresponding phase is just determined. So we know sort of where to look for, the, for a special trajectory with any particular uh, uh, topology. OK. Um, so OK, so, so now I can formulate finally what exactly are the sort of Donaldson-Thomas invariants or the BPS counting invariants in this particular problem. Um, namely, we're going to do the following thing. So we fix a particular quadratic differential, phi 2, um, and we fix a homology class in the spectral cover, call it gamma. Um, and then we ask, well, we, we form a, what, what first looks like a kind of funny combination. So we take the number of saddle connections which appear with that particular homology class. Um, and then we subtract two times the number of closed loops uh, um, which occur. Actually, I wrote closed loop pairs here. That's because, um, as it turns out, these, these closed loops, um, where's the chalk? Ah. Um, these closed loops, when they occur, they generally don't occur in isolation. So rather, um, if you have one closed loop in your foliation, um, then if you ask, what are the neighboring leaves of the, of the foliation like? Um, it turns out that they also have to be closed loops, and so on, until you reach a second, um, uh, uh, second branch point. So you get a picture like this. Um, in other words, they sweep out just an annulus. So in particular, you have these two closed loops on the boundary of the annulus. And I'm calling that a closed loop pair. So this, this whole structure, when it occurs, um, we'll count that um, with this funny number. We'll count that uh, um, as minus 2. Um, OK. So we're counting these saddle connections in closed trajectories, but we're counting them with this very particular uh, um, in this very particular way. Um, and these coefficients are really crucial. So for the whole wall crossing story that, that, uh, um, uh, that I'm going to tell, um, it's essential that you count the things in exactly this way. OK. Um, Excuse me, what do you call the number of saddle connections? The number of saddle connections. So, so literally, you know, um, at the, uh, right, at the, right at this critical phase. So we've got, some, we've got this gamma here. And so we take theta to be the argument of z gamma. And then you, just, you look at the foliation at exactly that moment. Um, and um, so yeah, what you, would, what you would, of course, usually expect um, is that you get either 0 or 1. Um, and in every example I've ever actually looked at, you always get either uh, 0 or 1. Um, but in principle, so I asked the quadratic uh, differential people whether it's possible to have more than one, you know, if you have a complicated enough, if you have a complicated enough surface. Um, and they told me, yeah, they think there are examples. Um, so where you have two things, um, uh, two things that occur simultaneously, and they're actually in the same homology class. Um, so in that case, you know, so if there are really two of them that occur simultaneously, then I would count that as two. Um, uh, but in general, you know, in every example I'll show you, the number will always be just 0 or 1. So you're free to think it's 0 if there's none and 1 if there is one. Um, OK. Uh, OK, great. So, um, uh, so, that's, so now these are our invariants. Um, uh, and so let's see an example. So let's take, again, uh, the curve to be just CP1. And now we're studying a quadratic differential with a, a slightly worse singularity infinity. Before I took z squared minus 1. Now I'm taking z cubed minus z. So it has three zeros. And here, OK, here's one, bang, one saddle connection, um, uh, which connecting the leftmost two zeros. Um, and then in a moment, we're going to see a second saddle connection appear. <coughs> bang, there's the second one. Um, so. Um, uh, uh, so in this case, um, as we varied this parameter theta from 0 to pi, um, uh, we found just exactly two saddle connections. So I could call the lift of this cycle, say, gamma 1, and the lift of this other cycle, say, gamma 2. So those are two little loops on the, on the spectral cover. Um, and so our invariants, our invariants are omega of gamma 1 equals 1, omega of gamma 2 equals 1. And in fact, if I vary theta from pi to 2 pi, I'll see the same picture again repeated. But then if you keep track of the orientations carefully, um, uh, you get minus gamma 1 and minus gamma 2. Um, so according to the definition of these invariants, we have omega of plus or minus gamma 1 equals 1, omega of plus or minus gamma 2 equals 1, um, and all the other invariants are just, uh, are just equal to 0. OK. 
Um, that's simple enough. Um, oops. Uh, OK, so now, um, uh, now I've, uh, this is a very similar picture where I've changed my parameters just a little bit. Um, so before I had z, z cubed minus uh, z, now we've changed the quadratic differential to be just z cubed minus 1. Um, so we've moved a little bit in the parameter space of quadratic differentials. Um, and now we see, um, instead of just 2, we see, uh, we see three of these uh, um, saddle connections. Um, so, and you know, uh, there's a corresponding uh, family of spectral curves. You know, we vary the quadratic differential correspondingly. We vary the, the spectral curve moves in a family. Um, and if you compare the homologies, so now we have, so this cycle here is the cycle that I used to call gamma 2. Um, this one is the new one, which didn't occur before. So that one has charge gamma 1 plus gamma 2. And then it's finally, finally there's this one, which has charge gamma 1. Um, so after we've changed our parameters a little bit, now we have three of these saddle connections instead of two. Um, and so concretely, one of these invariants has jumped. Um, the invariant which has jumped is this third one omega gamma 1 plus gamma 2, which used to be 0, and now it's 1. Um, so that's the, OK, fine. Um, so that's, uh, that's the picture. Oh, sorry. Um, so what did we just see? So as we, you know, as we deform the quadratic differential from this one into this one, um, so this is what I just said, the invariant um, uh, changed from 0 to 1. Um, uh, and so this is sort of the most basic example of this, uh, um, of this wall crossing phenomenon. So our parameter space, you know, what is our parameter space? It's a space of meromorphic quadratic differentials with some fixed singular behavior. Um, and on one side, we had this uh, uh, saddle connection. On the other side, we don't have it. OK. Um, OK, now here's a slightly fancier example. So, um, so here again, I'm taking the curve to be CP1. Um, but now we're studying quadratic differentials which have singularities both at 0 and at infinity, um, a singularity of order 3 in both places. Um, uh, and so I represent it as a cylinder. So 0 and infinity play, uh, um, play kind of symmetrical roles. Um, so, so here in this picture, um, uh, once again, there are, there are two saddle connections as theta varies from 0 to pi. Unfortunately, they occur at the very beginning and very end of this animation. So here are the two branch points. And here at this moment, you see two trajectories coming together. Bang, right there. Um, uh, the second one will be at the end. So just trajectories which are going around the cylinder in both directions, one that goes around this way um, and one that goes around the other way. Um, and so correspondingly, here we have just two invariants, two non-zero invariants. They're equal to 1. All the rest are equal to 0. Um, uh, but now suppose I deform that one. So now I'm, I'm, again, on the same parameter space. I've just deformed this quadratic differential just by adding a constant term. Um, uh, and after making that deformation, well, maybe you already saw it. So, so the uh, um, the picture has become much, much more complicated. So now, um, so now as I vary the phase, um, I encounter actually infinitely many saddle connections, infinitely many saddle connections, which are winding more and more times uh, um, around this cylinder. Um, so let's see it again. Um, so, so here's the first one, the second one, the third one. And so on, there's, um, uh, there's an infinite tower of them winding more and more times. Um, and then right at the very middle, right at the very middle of that picture, there's a critical moment where you actually have uh, closed trajectories, where there's a trajectory that just begins at, at, say, this 0, winds around the cylinder, and comes back to the same 0. And similarly down here. Um, so, so right at that moment, uh, um, right at that moment, we have these closed trajectories. And so correspondingly here, um, the invariants have become seemingly much, much more complicated. So here, we have this infinite collection of non-zero invariants. So for any value of n, this is equal to 1 corresponding to a saddle connection. And then we have also this one critical moment where we had the closed trajectories. And so there's one omega which actually equals uh, minus 2, according to this definition that I wrote down. 
Um, and again, all the others are equal to zero. Um, so, uh, so okay, so, so, um, so here we had just two non-zero invariants. Here we had this infinite collection of non-zero invariants. Okay. Um, so now the sort of amazing thing, for us it was amazing, uh, at least when we first learned about it, is that these wall crossing phenomena that, that we just observed um, are completely determined by the single kind of universal formula, which was written down, I mean, in the form that I'm going to describe it, it was written down by Kinsevich Soibelman. Um, I think an analogous thing uh, uh, was written down also by Joyce and Song. Um, so the claim is that just knowing the spectrum of trajectories on one side, in other words, just knowing about these two trajectories here, using this wall crossing formula, we can actually determine what will be this complicated infinite spectrum of trajectories on the other side. Um, so let me now tell you uh, how this formula works. Um, um, and to formulate this formula, um, you need an ingredient which at first looks kind of strange. So, so far I've been talking about quadratic differentials, and now we're going to introduce something which at first seems to have nothing to do with uh, uh, the quadratic differentials. Um, uh, so let's consider, uh, um, let's consider just a torus. So this is just C star to the n. Um, but I'll write it as the hom from, uh, um, from the lattice gamma uh, in the C star. So this is, this is a torus who's sort of... Yeah, what is your gamma here? I'm sorry. Oh, gamma was this lattice. It was the first homology of the spectral curve. Um, so, this is, so another way of thinking of this is that it's representations of... Pi, of well, okay, I'll come to it later. Gamma is, just, gamma is the first homology of the spectral curve. Um, so this torus, it's C star to the n, but the way, I, the way we present it here, it's sort of canonical coordinate functions um, are labeled by uh, choices of gamma. So for every gamma, we get a kind of Fourier mode along this torus, a C star valued function um, that you just get by, just get by evaluation. Um, OK, so we're supposed to think about this torus. Um, and now, um, uh, Kinsevich and Soibelman invite you to consider um, a certain automorphism of this torus. Um, so to give you the automorphism, I just have to tell you uh, what happens to these, what happens to the coordinates of the torus. So for each gamma, we'll define this automorphism, call it k gamma. Um, and the way this automorphism acts, um, it takes a coordinate x, well, let me call it x gamma prime. It maps the coordinate x gamma prime to again x gamma prime, but multiplied by some factor. The sigma of gamma is a kind of tricky sign that enters into this story. So. Uh, it would be better if we ignore it for now. Just imagine that. Uh, it's not because of the group structure. Uh, no, no, we're not using the group structure on the torus. No, that's right. This is a very nonlinear automorphism. So it's an automorphism of the torus, just considered as a complex. Uh, you know, know as it's a very directional transformation. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, automorphism. No, no, no. Yeah, not an automorphism of the group. No, no. Um, that's right. A birational map of the torus to itself, um, just given just given by this formula. So here, the sigma of gamma is some tricky sign. Um, and this uh, uh, pairing here is just the intersection pairing on the homology of the, uh, of the torus. OK, so, so Kinsevich and Soibelman say, consider that automorphism. OK. Um, and now what do we do? OK, so, so, so now um, uh, we're going to draw a picture. So each, each curve on this picture corresponds to one of the saddle connections or closed trajectories that, that uh, um, uh, that I showed you in the pictures before. Um, so concretely, so here is the axis where we're varying the quadratic differential. So let me use B for the space of these quadratic differentials, the parameter space. And theta, well, theta is the parameter theta that we had before. Um, and then, you know, if for some quadratic differential, we have a saddle connection that appears at some particular theta, then I put a dot here. So that's what this picture is. It's all phi twos and the phases at which the, the um, the saddle connections or closed trajectories occur. So I just plot the ones for which omega is not equal to 0. So just the ones for which you actually have one of these things. Um, and now the fact that these lines are kind of uh, branching like this reflects exactly this phenomenon of wall crossing. So um, the, moment when you, um, the moment when you reach the wall um, is actually, well, um, it's a, it's a, consequence of this formula, or you can also see it directly, um, the places where you reach the walls are exactly the moments when the phases of two objects um, uh, become aligned. So here we have two objects. Say these could be the guys with charge gamma 1 and gamma 2. And on the other side of the wall, I have gamma 1, gamma 2, and also a new one has been born with charge, say, gamma 1 plus gamma 2. So this picture typically looks something like this. Uh, um, uh, OK, so. 
Kontsevich and Soibelman tell us to draw this picture. And now the wall crossing formula says now to do the following thing. So look at this, look at this picture and consider just any closed path on the picture, um, any contractible closed path. Um, and then as you, you go around this path, and every time you cross one of these, uh, um, one of these walls, in other words, every time, you, every time you meet one of the saddle connections or closed trajectories, um, you take a factor um, of this automorphism uh, k gamma um, raised to the power omega of gamma, or more exactly, plus omega of gamma if you're going up, and minus omega of gamma if you're going down. So for example, on this path, here I would have a k gamma. Yeah, what is k? What object is this k? So k gamma was the automorphism that we considered just a moment ago. Uh, the, sorry, the my rational transformation. So what we're building up, yeah, what we're building up is some very complicated looking automorphism, uh, some very complicated looking transformation of the torus into itself. These are non-commuting, and so we have to take the product in a particular order, indeed. Um, and so the order we take is just the order going around the path. So start somewhere, go around the path. Here you have an automorph. Here you have a transformation. It's on a cyclic order. It's not really order. Uh, that's right. It's a, it, well, okay. For a minute, just, just imagine that the path begins somewhere and ends somewhere. It depends where you start. Well, as it turns out, it'll turn out that it doesn't depend. Uh, the equation is part of the simple one that depends on the base. The equation is base It doesn't depend. It's equations. It's a I just say oil. It's just say oil. You have to check. No, no. It's equation. It doesn't depend on the equation. Right. So, so. OK, so, so for a minute, let's just suppose that the path begins somewhere and ends somewhere. Um, and uh, so we go around this path, um, and we multiply together these, uh, uh, these transformations of the torus. And now what the wall crossing formula says um, is that whenever you do this, for any contractible path whatsoever, when you come around, when you come around back, to the, uh, back to the start. I contract upstairs and downstairs. This is downstairs. There's no upstairs here. So this, this is, is contractible downstairs. Down, uh, contractible downstairs, but this is not a path on the curve. This is not a path on the curve. This is a path in the parameter space of quadratic differentials and uh, cross with a circle. But you aren't allowed to hit the point where the... I'm not allowed to go right through this point? Well, I mean, uh, in a sense, the formula will say that you are allowed to do that. But a priori, let's not allow that. Um, because exactly at that moment, these omega of gammas maybe are not quite well defined. So let's avoid that, that singular situation. Um, I won't go straight through here. Um, so then what the wall crossing formula says is that whenever you do this, um, you multiply together these, all these transformations of the torus, and what you get when you come around the loop is you should actually get the trivial. But is this true if not contractible curve, this thing will not depend on the class? Um, uh, yes, then there's... But so this is a better form, you just from the fundamental group somewhere, right? Uh, yeah, I mean, let me formulate it for now only for, uh, uh, only for contractible paths. Um, so, uh, okay, so... Oh, it's a problem with right? If, uh, yeah, if you form it locally, yeah. you know it happens locally, probably. Yeah, it's a bit divergent. Yeah. The typical story, it's a bit divergent. So, um, uh, so, okay, so, so here's at least a formula. It's not clear yet why this is a wall-crossing formula, but here's a condition which you could put. Um, it's not a condition, it's a fact. It follows from the previous definition. This, Yes. Here's a, here's a formula, um, which indeed follows from the previous definitions, but in a very non-obvious way. Um, uh, so, okay, so let's see why is this, why is this actually a wall-crossing formula. Um, so it's a wall-crossing formula because suppose I take my path P to be actually a kind of rectangular path like this. So here I'm focusing on one particular sort of wall-crossing event, where I have some, some uh, non-zero invariance on one side and some other non-zero invariance on the other side. So suppose I go around this path. Um, I don't cross anything here. Here I cross some non-zero invariance um, at the quadratic differential phi 2. Now I go around this path. And here I cross some, uh, some lines corresponding to the um, non-zero invariance at the quadratic differential phi 2 prime, different from phi 2. Um, so what the wall crossing formula says in this case is that the transformation that I meet, the composite transformation that I meet by crossing these guys should be just equal to the composite transformation that I meet by crossing these guys. Because in going around this path, I'm going to meet the transformation here times, if I keep track of the orientation, the inverse of the transformation that I got here. So in other words, if I define a product, if I de define the product just going from theta 1 to theta 2, sorry, here I called them theta and theta prime, um, if I take the product of the transformations that I meet here, it should be equal to the product of the transformations that I meet on this side. So the wall crossing formula just says that these two are literally equal. Um, oh. 
And now the, uh, um, uh, the, the miracle about this is that this formula, this condition, is actually strong enough to determine all of the omegas on this side uh, in, terms of, uh, um, in terms of the omegas on this side. Um, so, so in that sense, this thing is a wall-crossing formula. By the way, you might ask, why does it not simply determine them to be equal? Why doesn't, why doesn't this formula just say that the omegas on this side are equal to the omegas on that side? Um, and the reason is exactly that um, the product that I take on this side is occurring in a different order from the product that I'm taking on this side. So here, for example, if this is gamma 1 and this is gamma 2, here I would be taking gamma 1 before gamma 2. Here I'm taking gamma 2 first, then gamma 1. And to compensate the fact that they don't commute, I have to insert some new things in the middle um, to make those two products be equal. Um, Isn't it some, some kind of zero curvature, curvature condition? It, yeah, it is. That, that's right. It is a kind of zero curvature condition for some, for some connection. But, but let me not try to formulate it now. <laughs> um, uh, OK, so, so, um, uh, so now let me say, so um, these two wall crossing phenomena that, we've, uh, that we already observed are really just governed by instances of exactly this formula. So, so first, suppose I have two, um, two charges whose intersection product is just one. That was what happened in the first example that. Uh, Andy, why, why don't you want to answer that question? I mean, this is not this is a flat connection that you study in a kitchen and. No, no, no. It's a different complex. No, this is, this is not a connection over the curve, exactly. This is, some, this is a connection which lives over the parameter space of. Uh, um, uh, over the parameter space of quadratic differentials. And, um, so, no, it's something a little bit. Uh, uh, it's a little bit trickier, so. But no, but formally it is connection with the Sarachi group is uh, automorphism group of your torch. That's right. Yeah, formally it is connection. That's right. So there is such a connection in the story, but. Uh, it's formally just there. Yeah. Um, okay, so, so, but I'm trying to say something sort of much simpler. So, so, uh, um, uh, so, so suppose, for example, that I have uh, um, uh, just two charges whose symplectic, whose, uh, um, whose intersection product is one. Um, so then, if I look at the, these two automorphisms, I look at their composition, just k gamma 1, k gamma 2. Um, so that's what, I'll have, um, that's what I'll have on one side of a wall. And then I look at a wall where the, uh, the central charge is z gamma 1 becomes aligned with z gamma 2. On the other side of the wall, I'll meet these things in the opposite order. I'll meet k gamma 2 first, k gamma 1 last. And then uh, k gamma 1 and k gamma 2 don't commute. But um, in order to fix up that non-commutation, you just have to insert one more uh, transformation, uh, k gamma 1 plus gamma 2. Um, so this is an identity. Once you know it, you can easily check it by hand just with the, form with the definitions of these transformations. Um, and so what it, says, uh, what it says is exactly that if I have two saddle connections on one side of a wall, whose inner product is 1, um, then on the other side of the wall, I have exactly three saddle connections. Uh, the two original ones and one more. And that's exactly what we saw in this uh, example that I, that I showed you. I'm, I'm not seeing intuitively why it has to be in the middle and not one of the sides. Oh, because so you have a linear map. So you have a, so, sorry. Um, so you know, the ordering is controlled by the phases of these uh, uh, z gammas, right? Um, so you have a linear map z from gamma to c. Um, and so I'm just uh, the ordering just comes from the fact that if z gamma 1 is, say, here, um, and z gamma 2 is, say, here, then because it's linear, z gamma 1 plus gamma 2 um, will be sitting, uh, say, here. And so um, the ordering is controlled by the phase of z gamma. So the phases, so you see the phases come in this particular order. Gamma 1 plus gamma 2 always comes between gamma 1 and gamma 2. So that's all that's, that's all that's going on here. And that's what controls the ordering of all of these products. Uh, um, no, but phase is circular. We mean between in the circle. Sorry? The phase is circle. There is no between there. Well, there's no, be there's no between. But here, when I drew this path, you know, that path kind of breaks the symmetry of the circle. That's right. It's small interval. Yeah, I mean, you're, you're just looking at a little interval where you're taking this contractible path. So on that little interval, there's a definite ordering. And, and the ordering is, as I said. Um, yeah? Is it so that if you don't know in advance that you have to find this uh, on the next, next page, please, uh, if you don't know what to have in the right-hand side, can you deduce it? Right, so that's, that's the amazing thing, is that yes, you can deduce it. Um, uh, uh, yeah, um, so it's indeed uniquely determined by, uh, um, by this formula. Um, and here's a more complicated example of, uh, of the same thing. Um, suppose I have uh, um, 
Uh, again, two invariants which are equal to one. So here, uh, this is k gamma to the power one, k gamma two to the power one. And the only thing you change is that the, um, the intersection between the, the two charges should be two instead of one. Um, and in that case, you try to do the same thing. You, you take this product and you try to rewrite it as a product of things um, in the opposite order. You find, again, that it can be done, um, but, uh, but the formula that you have to write is somehow much more complicated. It now has infinitely many of these uh, transformations, an infinite tower of them um, uh, in x by n, another infinite tower um, multiplied in, in the opposite order, um, uh, and then in the middle, um, you have to put one, uh, so all these occurred um, with the exponent one, and then in the middle you have to put one special thing which occurs with the exponent minus two. Um, uh, so, this is, so this formula is exactly governing what happened in the, our second example, where we had on one side just two saddle connections, on the other side we had this infinite tower of saddle connections um, plus one uh, annulus of closed trajectories, which we counted with this vector uh, minus two. Um, so okay, um, and the claim is that in fact this is this is completely general. It doesn't just happen in these two examples, but it happens in every example. Um, so um, everything was hidden in that formula. How what is k? Right, right. So then in in that definition of k, there has to be some some deep thought that we can understand and you can tell us. And right. The definition is given. Then suppose I know nothing but the definition. Right. I come, I multiply left hand side, and I have to know why I will have this thing on the right hand side. The transformation includes itself. So how do you know? Um, you mean how did we, how did we know to make this particular definition of? Uh... I mean there was a question before, for example, on the right hand side you have gamma two, gamma one plus gamma two, and yeah. gamma one. Yeah. So writing left hand side with that homology, you already know that right hand side will be like that. That's right. <coughs> it follows from the definition. So how do I fill it? Why? You mean and on the second example, you have gamma one, gamma two equals two. Right. You already know that right hand side will be like that. Um, well, okay. Oh, so how how does one know? You mean how does one derive this formula? Yeah. Um, just as a purely algebraic question, how do you derive this formula? <laughs> fill it somehow. Uh, <laughs> how do you feel it? Yeah, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> 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 Um, so these formulas, I mean, maybe I should say, you can, you can uh, um, check these formulas uh, on a computer. So if you want to determine this formula up to any finite order, just as a purely algebraic question, how to find the thing on the right side from the thing on the left side. Um, no, but this infinite formula is just not. But this, this formula looks a little bit like a good decomposition depending on which bore subalgebra you choose. <coughs> like no, normal ordering, if you imagine. Gamma 2 is positive. Yeah, he's talking some feeling here, so he feels it somehow. Uh, gamma, me, gamma 2 is positive. <coughs> no, it's not, that they're posi it, it's not that they're positive and negative. They're, they're all positive. They're all positive. I mean, the, the, it's more like the following thing. No, but if I think... No, he means upper triangular, lower triangular. Yeah, no, but that's not what it is. They're all upper triangular. That's exactly what I'm saying. So, I mean, the, the, the sort of finite dimensional analog of this, so this is taking place in some infinite dimensional group, which is the group of symplectomorphisms. But if you wanted the kind of finite dimensional analog of what it is... No, but for nothing group, let's say. No, 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 no. But, I mean, here's, here's, the, here's the sort of analogous thing. Symplectomorphisms move... Sorry, just the group of, they're automorphisms of the torus, but they accidentally, they, they also preserve some symplectic structure, which I haven't mentioned. But say, uh, yes, but actually the formation of the torus is a more group, right? Yeah, no, 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 but here it has a completion, because have infinite product, we see the things in formal power series. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's There's some completion of this, and it's not just all Barashan, no, 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 no. Yeah, it's So what the speciality, they can form, they're symplectic. They preserve symplectic structure. They the complex symplectic structure. Yeah. That's right. Um, yeah, I mean, if you want the sort of finite dimensional analog of this, um, it's really the following kind of thing. So, um, so suppose that I consider this product, um, uh, where here I took the, the 1, 2 thing before the 2, 3 thing. And if I try to write them in the opposite order, um, it'll have the following shape. Um, and then in the middle, So, so uh, these two things don't quite commute, um, uh, but they, sorry, I guess minus here. 
um, uh, these two things uh, don't quite commute. And to correct the failure to commute, you have to insert this uh, extra guy that's given by you know, the sum of these two roots. Um, so that's the, uh, um, that's the kind of finite dimensional analog of what we're doing here. Yeah, you can order positive roots. Yeah. Order in different ways. Uh, yeah. uh, excuse me. Yeah. You said that on the right hand side you have k gamma 2 and k gamma 1 in the opposite order. That's right. But in the last line, I don't see them at all. Um, oh, sorry. Uh, excuse me. This should be, the, the product should be from 0 to infinity, not from 1 to infinity. Thank you. Sorry. Uh, could you explain uh, why k is defined uh, by the formula? You mean why k is given by this particular formula? Uh, so that's okay. So so that's what I'm going to uh, describe in the second part of the talk. So 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 far I've I've just told you this formula, um, and I've told you that you know what looks like a miracle um, that this formula, this totally algebraic game, um, actually you know correctly captures the wall crossing behavior of these trajectories of quadratic differentials. Is there some connection with great groups? Um, Let's say I'm not aware of a connection with uh, uh, with break groups. Um, so so okay so 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 now you can ask you know why is it right why do these um, why does this totally algebraic uh, um, thing just moving transformations of a torus why does that have anything to do with the, the special trajectories of quadratic differentials? Okay so okay. Um, so uh, there's by now a few different ways of understanding uh, this, but let me choose one particular way of, of describing it here. Um, so we'll take what at first seems like a big detour. So um, uh, we're going to use the quadratic differentials now in a totally different way. Um, so we're going to think of them as having something to do with the asymptotics of solutions of one parameter families of differential equations. Um, so it'll take, us, it'll take us a little while to get there. So for a while, you won't see these k gammas appear. We're just going to do something else with quadratic differentials. OK. So, so first of all, actually, we're not going to quite just use uh, the quadratic differentials. We're going to rather use uh, um, Higgs bundles. So it's a, just a slightly fancier object. Um, so, uh, so suppose I have, again, I have this curve C, and I'm going to fix uh, some rank 2 holomorphic vector bundle. Let me call it E. Um, and then uh, uh, let's consider um, a meromorphic section of the endomorphisms of E tensor with the canonical bundle, the cotangent bundle of C. Um, and we'll take, it to be, we'll take it to be traceless. So if you like, we're, it's not just a vector bundle, it's a vector bundle with a volume form, and we're taking the thing to be valued in SL2. Um, so you know, locally, locally, what does it concretely mean? Um, it just means I'm, uh, we're making a matrix, um, uh, uh, a matrix of one form, so a matrix of meromorphic functions. Um, uh, like this. So that's what it looks like in every local patch where I choose a trivialization of this uh, vector bundle. Um, so, that, so a pair like that we call a Higgs bundle. Um, so OK, so the, the pair of a, uh, a holomorphic vector bundle plus this uh, one form valued endomorphism, that pair is called a Higgs bundle. Um, now, so given one of these Higgs bundles, um, we can recover a quadratic differential. Uh, how do we do it? We just take the trace of the square of this, of, this, uh, um, uh, of this field that we called phi. So phi was a one form valued thing. And so its square will be a, a, a quadratic differential. We take the trace of that. Then that's a globally defined thing that doesn't depend on any trivializations. Um, OK, so instead of the quadratic differential, we'll think about these Higgs, these Higgs bundles. Um, and now the spectral curve, which we used before. So before, I was looking at the, uh, um, this double cover that just came by taking the two square roots of the quadratic differential. Um, so now another way, of, another way of thinking about that is that um, those two sheets, those two square roots of the quadratic differential, are just the two eigenvalues um, uh, of, my, of my Higgs field. Um, so OK, so the point of the spectral curve are, are the eigenvalues of the Higgs field. OK. Um, so okay, so the you know so the Higgs bundle has a little bit more information than the quadratic differential. I mean, uh, morally speaking, the quadratic differential only knew about the eigenvalues, and now we're uh, also introducing we're introducing this phi. Um, so it not only has eigenvalues, but it has eigenspaces. Um, and so the 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 space of Higgs bundles um, is not just equal to the space of quadratic differentials, but rather it's a vibration over the space of quadratic differentials. So by passing from uh, phi to by passing from phi to its trace squared, I forget a little bit of information. Um, one way of saying the information that I forget is 
I forget the eigenspaces. The eigenspaces form, exact, form a line bundle over the spectral curve. Um, and so what we get here is really a complex integrable system. Roughly what you have is the Jacobians of the spectral curves, which are some, some tori. Um, uh, but today, we're basically only interested in this phenomenon that takes place just over the base, just over the space of quadratic differentials. Um, and so I won't care much about exactly where I am on the, uh, on the torus fibers. I'll just take any Higgs, any Higgs field uh, um, corresponding to that quadratic differential. OK. Um, OK, so, so um, I just reminded you what's a Higgs field. Um, uh, we're going to be interested not just in Higgs fields, but also in flat connections over the curve. Um, so okay, maybe it's unnecessary for this audience, but I remind you what is, what is, a, what is a flat connection. So again, locally, uh, um, um, uh, so a, a, flat, a connection is something that allows you to differentiate sections, um, to differentiate sections of, your, uh, of your bundle. So locally, again, if I've trivialized, uh, um, if I've locally trivialized my bundle, um, then I could write the, um, so then its sections are just some little two by two, uh, uh, some little two by two vectors of functions. And to differentiate uh, one of them uh, according to this section, well, I take its derivative, it, its partial derivative in the usual sense, and I add to that um, some traceless matrix acting on my section. Um, so locally, the connection is just represented by this pair of traceless matrices, AZ and uh, uh, AZ bar. Um, and then we say that the connection is flat exactly if there exists, you know, if, in, if, uh, um, if locally I can find um, uh, a basis for my bundle E, um, which is annihilated by the connection. Um, so, you know, a flat connection, in other words, giving a flat connection is equivalent to giving um, some system of linear differential equations, um, which are just these equations, some compatible system of linear differential equations. Um, okay. Um, and so, you know, if I'm given um, a flat SL2C connection, um, you know, one of the things I can do is I can take its parallel transport, by which I mean, you know, um, uh, sorry, I said parallel transport, but I should really say the monodromy uh, operation. So, you know, I started in some neighborhood. I have the local solutions of this equation, nabla s equals zero. Um, then I, I continue them. Uh, um, using this equation, nabla s equals zero, continue them along some path on the curve, come back to the original point, and I'll come back to potentially some different, uh, um, uh, some different solutions. But they, they differ from the original solutions just by an element of SL2. So what we get is a, is a representation um, of the fundamental group of the curve into SL2C, um, up to equivalence. Um, uh, and conversely, you can recover um, uh, the connection from this representation up to gauge transformation. Up to isomorphism, right? Say so Kawa gauge transformation makes no sense. Up to isomorphism. Um, yeah, up to equivalence of connections. Um, so, um, uh, but on the other hand, the map, you know, concretely, if I'm, if I'm given these matrices representing the connection uh, locally, um, if I'm given these matrices and I want to construct the corresponding representation, it's in some sense a sort of complicated map to go from the, um, uh, to go from the explicit matrices to the uh, um, uh, to the corresponding monodromy representation. Okay. Um, okay. So I was I was talking on the one hand about Higgs bundles, on the other hand about flat connections. Um, now there's this miraculous fact, um, uh, which is I guess is, is due to you know, Hitchin, Donaldson, Corlett, um, and then in the in the cases. Uh, in the cases with singularities, which we'll come to in a moment, it's Simpson and uh, Bicard and Bolch. Um, so the remarkable fact is the following. So suppose someone gives you one of these Higgs bundles. So we've got a quadratic differential. We've chosen a Higgs bundle. Suppose someone gives you one of those. Um, then there's a corresponding, totally canonical, um, one parameter family of flat connections in that bundle. Um, so it's parameterized by a, a parameter zeta. Um, uh, uh, so it's, this is going to be a C star family. Um, and what that family looks like, uh, um, well, it looks like this. It's of, it's of this simple kind of uh, uh, three-term form. Um, so uh, here we have the original, the original Higgs field. Um, here we have some connection which is actually unitary relative to um, uh, a metric in the bundle. Um, and then here we have the, um, the adjoint of the Higgs field. Um, so, so this is this is uh, um, this is not a simple thing because if you look at this if you look at this family of connections, um, 
uh, to require that that connection is flat and to require that it's flat for every value of the parameter zeta, uh, that requires some equations, um, you know, roughly the, the, to be flat, it says the bracket of nabla with nabla is zero. And so that Im imposes some equations on this phi, phi dagger, um, nd. Um, and those equations are some complicated partial differential equations. They're, they're Hitchens equations. Um, so the theorem that, the, that this um, deformation exists is kind of a hard, uh, um, is a hard uh, PDE theorem. Um, but nevertheless, it's true. So, so given a Higgs bundle, there's this uh, uh, associated um, one parameter family of uh, uh, flat connections. Um, OK. Uh, and to understand this wall crossing phenomenon, we're going to understand it as some property of this family of flat connections. OK, well, actually, um, uh, here we're considering um, the Higgs field that we consider um, is not going to be holomorphic, but rather meromorphic, because our, our, the quadratic differential had some singularities. And so correspondingly, the, the, the Higgs fields that we consider will have some, will have some singularities. Um, and so corresponding to that, you know, we don't get connections um, on the whole curve, but we get connections with singularities um, uh, at the same points. So, you know, if the, if the Higgs bundle that we consider, if the Higgs field has just simple poles, um, then this family of connections, each member of that family will be a connection with regular singularities. And so in that case, um, we just encounter a representation um, not of pi 1 of the original curve, but rather pi 1 of the curve with these points deleted. So there's monodromy around those singularities. Um, and if the, um, if the Higgs field has higher order poles, um, then the connection has some more complicated singularities, so-called irregular singularity. Um, and in that case, the, uh, the representation, um, well, you still have a monodromy representation. Um, you still have a monodromy representation, but the monodromy representation doesn't capture all the information about the connection, not even all the, the gauge invariant information. So it's replaced by some, uh, something a little more complicated, the so-called Stokes data. Um, I don't want to say, uh, I don't want to try to say anything in detail about this Stokes phenomenon. We're going to talk a lot about a different Stokes phenomenon, which occurs in the asymptotics of this family of connections as zeta goes to zero. But independent of that, there's also this, uh, um, this other Stokes phenomenon that occurs here. Um, so this kind, of, this kind of example sounds harder. But actually, it turns out that the most tractable examples are, are this kind of example. Um, because here you can get something non-trivial, even if you take the curve to be CP1. Right? The monodromy representation, well, in fact, you can take CP1, even CP1 with just a single singularity. So then the monodromy representation would be absolutely trivial. But nevertheless, you can get something interesting here. OK. Um, so, so OK, so now we can formulate a, a, a question. So. Um, so we have a Higgs bundle. We're given a Higgs bundle, and we have a corresponding family of connections, um, according to this, uh, 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 according to the, this non-abelian Hodge correspondence. Um, and for each one of them, uh, we have a corresponding representation um, of the fundamental group. So we have a family of representations of the fundamental group, um, and it, it, they're varying holomorphically with zeta for zeta and c star. Um, and we can ask the question: How does this family behave? Um, as the parameter zeta goes to zero or infinity. In some sense, if we want to understand this family completely, um, you know, because, it's, because it's holomorphic uh, for zeta and c star, understanding it completely boils down to just understanding what happens as zeta goes to zero, or as zeta goes to infinity, but there's a symmetry exchanging zero and infinity. So doing zero is essentially enough. Um, so understanding this is like, well, OK, we want to understand this. Um, OK, so what's the idea? Um, well, the idea is, so this family of connections comes to you in this explicit form. Um, uh, and so in particular, you know, in the limit as zeta goes to 0, um, what would you think? So you look at this connection, and what it looks like is it's dominated by the first term. Um, uh, so, so very naively, you would think that uh, to find a solution, it might be enough just to deal with this, just to deal with this first term. Um, so what does it suggest? Whoops. Uh, oh yeah, that's right. Um, uh, so what it suggests is that you know, in order to try to build a solution of this equation, what should you do? Um, the key thing would be to just diagonalize uh, uh, this this Higgs field, um, because if you want to solve the equation, uh, no. is there an uh, eraser? Um, Uh, 
So if you want to solve the equation, uh, um, you know, the derivative of s equals um, some function times s, that's essentially easy. You just get that um, s is the integral of this function dz. Um, uh, so you know, if we forget the difference between that d there and the partial derivative operator for just a second, um, and if we diagonalize the leading term, so if I have f over zeta here, then correspondingly I'll have the integral of f over zeta here. Um, so, so, uh, so if we if we forget that d is not the partial derivative, um, and if we diagonalize the leading term, then you might think, uh, um, uh, well, you might look at least for a solution for a for a basis of solutions of this form. So I just take the various eigenvalues and just integrate each eigenvalue. Um, uh, so this is what this is what you might try. Um, now, well, okay, so, so, th so the first thing you say is, well, let's find a solution which looks at least asymptotically like this. Let's try to do that. Um, well, a little more precisely, you know, uh, if you take a solution like that, um, with, whose leading term is what I wrote, and you plug it back into the equation, um, of course, you can't, the solution will not exactly be given by that. Um, but what you might try is to make a series, um, uh, a series in zeta um, whose leading term is given by the thing, uh, by the thing that I wrote. Um, so let's try. So suppose you try that. Um, so we're going to have a we're going to have a basis of kind of candidate solutions, um, parameterized by the eigenvalues of the of the Higgs field, um, and each solution is going to look like just a series like this. Um, well, okay. So 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 indeed, you know, you you write this series, um, you substitute this series back into the equation. Um, and you get equations which sort of iteratively determine all the higher terms. Um, so, uh, um, so that's great. So it, so it looks like you've managed to solve the equation. I mean, you, you, at least locally, right? You diagonalize the Higgs field locally. You get this basis of solutions. And now you've, you've completely solved it. So in particular, what it would mean is that you know, um, all the dependence on a base point is only here, only in this integral. And so it would say that you know, in order to evolve the equation, in order to work out its monodromy, all you have to do is evaluate some integrals of, the, um, integrals of these forms. Um, all right, so that would be pretty good. Um, so it would be great. It would be great if this were true. Um, but actually, it cannot be true. Um, why it cannot be true? Well, OK, so, so suppose that there existed actual solutions of this form. Um, so we have them locally on every domain where you can diagonalize the Higgs field. So, so then you could study the parallel transport, indeed, just by patching these solutions together. Um, and the little overlaps here would just be given by some integrals, integrals of this kind. Um, OK, so that would be nice. Um, now, the local solutions, um, as we just said, they're labeled by the, eigen, they're labeled by the eigenvalues of this Higgs field. Um, and so imagine that we move. So we move around on the curve. We move around one of the branch points of this covering. So concretely, these are the zeros of the quadratic differential. Um, so as you move around one of these points, um, the two eigenvalues, uh, what I'm calling here lambda 1 and lambda 2, those two eigenvalues are being exchanged. That's true for the leading term of this series, but it's also true for all the subleading uh, terms, because they're determined algebraically by the leading term. Um, so if you had literal actual solutions of this form, then the parallel transport um, around a branch point would exchange them. Um, uh, well, OK. So that says that the, the parallel transport operator here um, uh, exchanges these, these two solutions. But that contradicts the fact that, that this, this uh, connection was supposed to be a flat connection, not only on the region where we can diagonalize the thing, but a flat connection on the whole, uh, on the whole curve. Um, so here we're finding. In this approximation, which by the way is, is uh, usually called the WKB approximation, um, in this approximation, um, uh, we, find a, we find a monodromy, but that monodromy um, cannot be there, cannot be there for the actual solutions. So, so what went wrong? Um, we wrote these formal series solutions, and we've just seen that they sort of can't be real, they can't actually exist. They can't exist because of this obstruction from the monodromy. Um, so, but they're defined by a totally reasonable procedure. The only thing that can go wrong is that uh, um, this series that we wrote is really only a formal series. So the series has zero radius of convergence. 
Um, so formally it's fine, but actually it is not fine. It has this problem. Um, OK. Well, so then you might, uh, um, you might say, OK, well, this is only a, only a formal thing, and it's useless in the actual world. Um, but on the other hand, this WKB approximation, this is something that people use all the time, and it, it does seem to have some use. Um, so, so how do we make sense of it? Um, well, we can try to make sense of these series not as an actual formula for an actual solution, but only as a, an asymptotic expansion of the solution. So this is a series which doesn't have to converge. It doesn't converge for any fixed value of zeta, but it gives the asymptotics of some actual solution. Well, OK, so, so as it turns out, um, uh, you, can, you can make sense of it as an, as an asymptotic expansion. But as usual with asymptotic expansions, um, this asymptotic expansion is not going to be valid globally. So we're not going to find solutions that have these asymptotics kind of uniformly as zeta goes to 0 in any direction. Um, but suppose we ask for something a little bit less. Um, suppose, we ask for, um, uh, suppose we ask for solutions which have these asymptotics um, only in some sector. In fact, it, it seems that the right thing to do is to take a half space. So, um, so let's fix, uh, um, fix some angle theta, which is the same theta that appeared before, as we'll see. Um, fix some angle theta. Um, and let's ask for solutions which have these asymptotics as zeta goes to 0 just in the half space uh, h theta. Um, uh, so then uh, I make the following claim. So this is, this is uh, um, part of the joint work with, uh, um, with Gato and Moore. Um, the claim is that if I, around the generic point uh, um, of this curve, um, there are genuine actual solutions um, uh, so now, uh, again, depending on an eigenvalue of the Higgs field and depending on a phase theta, there are genuine actual solutions which do have this kind of asymptotic expansion as zeta goes to zero, but only in the half plane, only in some half plane. OK. Um, so let me explore a little bit the consequences of this, this claim. Um, so, you know, so I said we have these local solutions. Um, but these local solutions um, uh, can't patch together smoothly. Um, if they did, we would have the same monodromy problem that we had before. Saying that the asymptotics are only in some half space doesn't, doesn't get rid of that problem. Um, uh, so rather, these local solutions, um, these local solutions are going to jump. Um, and they jump at some kind of co-dimension 1 loci um, in the curve, um, which are the, the so-called Stokes lines. Um, so here they're the Stokes lines for the zeta goes to zero uh, asymptotics. Um, and the Stokes lines for these, for these local solutions of the equation, um, we've actually seen already in this talk. Um, so if we go back again to look at this uh, uh, quadratic differential, um, the, Stokes lines, uh, um, the Stokes lines for these local solutions um, are exactly the lines of the, uh, what I called before the spectral network. So the claim is now that we're studying this asymptote, we're studying this family of differential equations. Um, uh, we're looking for solutions with good asymptotics um, in a half space. And the claim is that you can find such solutions, um, but you can find them only in the complement of the, of, the, um, of the walls of this spectral network. Um, and then there's some jumping. So there will be some matrix that tells you when you cross any one of these walls, There'll be some matrix that tells you how the solutions in this domain are related to the solutions in this domain, and so on. And those are the so-called Stokes factors. OK. Um, so OK, so now, um, uh, so now you can come back to the, uh, um, uh, to the original question. Um, the question that we started with was, um, uh, well, sorry. Not yet the original question of wall crossing, but the question of studying the asymptotics of the, um, of the monodromy. Um, so suppose now that we have any closed loop, uh, um, suppose now that we have any closed loop on our curve, um, and we look at the monodromy um, around that loop. So now we're studying a family of connections, so we study that monodromy um, um, uh, in a family. Um, so we're getting some element of SL2C for every uh, choice of this parameter zeta. Um, and now you concretely try to compute that monodromy by the same strategy I was doing before. You just patch together. You have these local solutions, and you patch them together. But now you have to you take account of the fact that um, you have uh, uh, jumps along the walls of this uh, 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 spectral network. Um, so if you do that, you find the following picture. Um, you find that the uh, you find that the trace um, the trace that you're interested in. 
Um, so it, it by itself, its asymptotics are somehow uh, um, uh, um, well, uh, you find that the trace can be ex can be expanded in this form. So uh, um, uh, you have a sum over pieces which are uh, labeled by the homology classes um, by homology classes of this uh, uh, spectral cover. Um, uh, e so for each piece, we have some uh, some uh, function of zeta standing here, and they appear with some uh, um, with some coefficients, um, actually integer coefficients. Um, and so the picture is that as zeta goes to zero um, uh, in this half space, um, the, asymp the asymptotics of these functions, so these are the functions which you would get by sort of just naively doing the WKB procedure that I told you at the beginning. So um, you're just, you just uh, take this, uh, take the one form, the tautological one form on the spectral curve and just integrate it around uh, some cycles. Um, and what you're getting, what you're getting here is that the actual trace is given not just by a single thing like that, not just by a single integral around uh, some cycle, and not even the sum of two, which is what you might think if you have two solutions corresponding to the two eigenvalues. Um, but rather, it's given by some sum of pieces, um, uh, uh, each of which has, each of the pieces has the kind of naive asymptotics that you would expect from WKB. And they come to you in some, uh, they come to you in some uh, complicated combination. Um, and these coefficients, the coefficients that, that appear here um, are just de are determined just by taking your path and looking at how it intersects with the um, with the spectral network. So you start out trying to trying to study the asymptotics of uh, this holonomy function, and you find that the sort of good way of studying the asymptotics um, is indeed to do this WKB procedure. You just relate it to integrals over the spectral curve, but those integrals are a little bit more complicated than you might have thought um, because you have to keep track of how your path intersects with this uh, um, with this spectral network. Okay. Um, so in particular, now once you've got this far, now you can recover the zeta goes to zero asymptotics that you were interested in. Um, they're just dominated by whichever term has the largest uh, coefficient of this exponential. Okay. Um, uh, so there's another way of thinking about this, uh, um, thinking about this construction. So, um, uh, so for a moment, um, uh, let me not think about asymptotics and just look at this uh, formula as it stands. Um, so what we're saying is that if um, uh, if you have a uh, um, if you have an SL2 connection over uh, over a curve, um, there's a sort of useful way of organizing its organizing its uh, um, its invariants. So organizing the the holonomies um, around some path, namely the holonomy around a path, uh, the trace of the holonomy around some path um, gets expanded. In terms of some simpler objects, so these things here, these things here are the holonomies of some flat, uh, a flat connection which lives over the spectral cover. So that's exactly what the WKB naively said that you could do, right? It said that you could uh, um, you could relate the holonomy of your the parallel transport of your connection to just some integrals that you do over the spectral cover. Um, and here we have a kind of uh, um, we have a, a sharp version of that. Um, the only trick is that um, given any path here, you may have to expand it in terms of a bunch of different paths over the, over the spectral cover. Um, so this is a kind of, the slogan for this is that it's kind of abelianization. So um, you're interested in studying SL2C connections over the curve, and you relate them to something simpler. You relate them to C star connections over this, uh, uh, over this uh, covering. Um, now, of course, it's not literally like push forward. It's not like you have a, a diagonal connection and you push it forward. That would give you something diagonal downstairs. But the statement is that you take the push forward, and then you do some cutting and gluing along the, along the walls. And this cutting and gluing is exactly taking care of the Stokes phenomenon, um, the fact that the, the local solutions couldn't be extended uh, uh, globally. Um, so this cutting and gluing, just concretely speaking, what it involves is just sticking in some unipotent matrices uh, for the parallel transport. Every time you cross a wall, you have to stick in some unipotent matrix, and everything else is diagonal. Um, so, so okay. So, so in particular, you know what this says is that if you have an SL2C connection, um, and this is this is supposed to be uh, actually a one-to-one -one map. So the datum of the SL2C connection uh, over the curve is just equivalent up to the data of this connection up to equivalence is equivalent to the data of the C star connection up to equivalence over the, over the covering. And so what that says is that there's some coordinate system on the moduli of, uh, um, on the moduli of flat SL2C connections, just identified with the, um, uh, the moduli of, 
uh, see star connections over this covering. Um, and all I want to say is that uh, um, in this way, what you recover are some known uh, interesting coordinate systems. They're the so-called cluster coordinate systems on the moduli. Here it's just for SL2C connections, and so those are also called complexified shear coordinates. Um, but, in, but for the higher rank, which I'll hopefully get to at the end, um, for the higher rank, you get in this way some really new and exotic looking coordinate systems, um, some of which had been studied by, by Fakhin Gansharov. Um, OK. So, so this abelianization is a thing which you can talk about without talking about WKB, without talking about this asymptotics. But what I've said here is that it arises very naturally. If you think about the asymptotics, you're sort of forced to think about this abelianization. OK. Um, OK, so now, so, so now we can come back to the question. Uh, we're studying these asymptotics. And what happens now if I try to vary the parameters? So I, I move a little bit in the Hitchin base, or I move my, my phase theta. So remember the phase, I'm, we're studying asymptotics just in some half space, and theta is controlling which half space we're, uh, um, we're looking at. Um, so let me re remind you of what happens. Uh, so if we vary the parameters phi 2 and theta just a little bit, um, then the spectral network just changes by an isotopy. Um, and a variation like that um, doesn't affect anything about how, you know, if I consider a closed path, say this closed path, closed path that goes around just two of these things, um, this WKB analysis is all about how the path intersects this uh, spectral network. Um, and if I just change the network by a little isotopy, I won't change this, uh, this WKB uh, uh, analysis. So in particular, these coefficients um, don't vary if I just vary uh, the spectral network a little bit. Um, all right, fine. Um, yeah, sorry. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, so as I vary these, these parameters further, um, I might cross one of these critical phases where a special trajectory appears. So these were exactly the things that we wanted to count. Um, and at that, at that moment, the WK picture of the, the WKB analysis of these closed paths changes. Or in other words, the abelianization, I have kind of two different ways of abelian, abelianizing a connection. Um, one involving the spectral network before this crossing, and one involving the spectral network after this crossing. And those two structures are a little bit different. And so correspondingly, I get two different ways of expanding the holonomy in terms of abelian holonomies. So two different, two different expansions. Um, so these coefficients omega are changing. Um, but on the other hand, the original SL2C connection, the original SL2C connection that you were studying uh, doesn't jump. Um, it just varies, you know, if I change theta, I don't change this connection at all. If I move in the Hitchin base, then I move this connection, but I move it in a continuous way. Um, so if these coefficients are jumping, um, in order for the whole story to be consistent, these abelian holonomies, the holonomies on the cover, uh, have to also jump. Um, and we can calculate that jump. Um, so the way that these omegas change is just determined by the topology of how the spectral network uh, degenerates. And so you can really calculate that jump. You can calculate it directly from the, from the topology of the degeneration. And so now what you get, oh, sorry. Um, and so what do you get? Well, so first, suppose that the spectral network degenerates in a way that just includes one of these saddle connections. Um, so the picture is that. Um, the picture is that uh, um, we have something like this. And then after the degeneration, we have something like this. So here's two different spectral networks with two different corresponding ways of abelianizing your connection. Um, you can ask, how do those two abelianizations differ? So here, I'm getting some functions x gamma. Here, I'm getting some functions x prime gamma, which are the holonomies of this abelian connection upstairs. Um, and the statement is that those two are they're different, but they're different in a computable way. And the way that they differ, they differ exactly by this map which appeared in the wall crossing formula, so this transformation. Um, so in this case, x prime gamma equals x gamma times uh, 1 minus x gamma naught, where gamma naught is the homology class of the thing that appeared in the middle. Um, so the, the jump of the abelianized connection is exactly given by this k 
gamma. So here's the moment where um, here's the moment where we're we're if you like explaining or re-encountering the same formula that appeared there. Um, so that's a relatively easy computation. What's a little bit harder is what happens if you have this annulus of closed trajectories. Um, but there, uh, um, so there's a scheme for working it out. And when you work it out, you find that the jump there is exactly this k gamma now raised to the power of minus 2. Um, so, so in general, um, as we deform, as we move around in parameter space, the spectral network deforms. Um, and the jump of these function, these x gamma, which before they were formal coordinates on some torus, now they have a concrete meaning as the holonomies of an abelian connection. Um, the statement is that that torus should be thought of as the torus of abelian connections. And uh, the, these transformations, k gamma, um, are just the jumps that occur when you try to abelianize a single fixed SL2C connection using different spectral networks. Um, OK. So, so in particular, now if I come back to the, so you know, in each domain of this picture now, I have a particular spectral network up to isotopy and a particular way of abelianizing uh, the connection. Um, uh, and so in each one of these domains, you know, uh, if I let my non-abelian connection vary continuously, my, these, these x gammas um, parameterizing this abelian connection um, have to jump. And they jump by exactly this k gamma. On the other hand, if we go around a closed loop, if we travel around a closed loop and come back to the uh, original point, um, the x gammas are defined by just a univalent procedure. So we have to return to the original uh, um, uh, function's x gamma. Um, and that's exactly the wall crossing formula um, which we wanted to explain. Um, so the way we explain it is to find some concrete objects which actually transform by this funny looking transformation x gamma. And then because those objects are, uh, are uh, univalently defined, when I go around a loop, I have to come back to the original objects. That's it. Um, OK, so. Um, so the whole point was to explain this Kanseri uh, Schoberman simple ectomorphism formula. Um, well, it, and the explanation is that the, if you lift it to this flat connection, that right. it is uh, just right. a statement that the, nothing changes. That's right. That's right. So the statement is that you, if you study, a, um, uh, a, if you study a single non-abelian connection or a non-abelian an SL2C connection which varies continuously, um, that there's a procedure for relating it to an abelian connection, and that procedure is kind of forced on you if you try to study the WKB asymptotics. But even if you don't study the WKB asymptotics, there is this procedure. Now, that procedure depends on a choice of spectral network. And as you move around in the parameter space, um, the corresponding spectral network jumps. Um, and w the jumps of the spectral network are exactly these k gammas that appeared in the wall crossing formula. Um, yeah, that's the statement. Um, so OK. Uh, so what have I said? So, so we were considering some counting problem that had to do with the, these special trajectories of quadratic differentials. Um, uh, and what, what, what we found is that, first of all, they obey this conservative soibelman this kind of universal wall crossing formula. Um, and moreover, that if you want to explain that formula, or if you want to see it arise in some natural way, um, uh, one way that it arises naturally is when you s try to study the asymptotics of these families of SL2C connections that come from Hitchin equations. Um, so that suggests a kind of natural problem, which is, you know, what if I wasn't just interested in SL2, but what I was interested in SLK? Um, or more generally, I mean, it could be any lead group, but let's just start with uh, uh, SLK um, for K bigger than 2. Um, and so here, following the exact same kind of strategy, um, you meet a new kind of counting problem, which so far hasn't been much explored. So these, these objects here, these special trajectories, are a kind of classically studied thing. People in Teichmuller theory have studied them a lot. Um, but the higher rank analog, which I'm now going to briefly tell you about, um, has been relatively little explored. So I think it's an interesting problem. Um, <clears throat> OK, so, so let's just start again. So, so now um, I'm going to start with the Higgs field. Um, so, and now make it SLK valued, so just a rank K matrix instead of rank 2. Um, so now I'll define the spectral curve to be, again, just parameterized by the eigenvalues. It's just parameterizing the eigenvalues of this, uh, um, of this Higgs field. Um, so you know, locally, one way of thinking about it is that uh, 
well, the covering is the same as giving the covering is the same as giving k just holomorphic one forms, or more concretely, the Higgs field. Just take the eigenvalues of the Higgs field. That gives you k uh, one forms, which vary holomorphically. Now, globally, they have monodromies, so we don't get k global things. But locally, you have k one forms. Um, and now, so so um, so. It seems, so in this work with uh, Gaiato and Moore, we've tried to generalize the, um, the whole WKB story that I just told you to this uh, situation. Um, and it seems that it works. Um, but uh, the structure of the Stokes lines, so the structure of the, the analog of this spectral network will be more complicated than it was in the, in the case k equals 2. Um, so let me tell you, let me give you now the definition, a definition analogous to this definition of the trajectories of quadratic differentials. I'm going to give you the higher ranked version of those trajectories. Um, so as before, we're going to fix a phase. Um, and now we'll define a network. Um, so the network is going to be made up of Stokes lines. And let me first tell you what's the local structure of those Stokes lines. So before, they were the, they were the leaves of this foliation. Um, now I'll describe them by a differential equation, and they're not anymore leaves of a global foliation. Um, now they're going to be carrying some label, um, labeled by two sheets, i and j. So in other words, two eigenvalues of this Higgs field. So you choose out any two eigenvalues, and then you can write this differential equation. So it says that, um, uh, well, it says this. So you take lambda i minus lambda j. Um, that gives you some one form. And you ask that that one form, when evaluated on your tangent vector, tangent vectors to your, to your lines, um, should, be, should have phase theta. Um, so that equation, that's you know first order equation, it defines for you, again, locally, locally a foliation. You're taking the leaves of this foliation. But now globally, um, the, the different uh, kinds of line can mix. Um, and then, so, so now, uh, um, the local structure around the branch points is going to be much the same as it was before. Um, at each branch point, uh, now the branch points are labeled by two sheets of the covering. So I'm, I'm again, let me assume that I'm in the situation of simple ramification. So we only have places where two sheets collide. Sorry, you have foliation on the spectral curve? No, there's no foliation on the spectral curve because, because the, here, the, the, the leaves of this foliation depend on a choice of two sheets. So if you like, it could be on some product, symmetric product. Or, uh, but I prefer to think of it just directly on the on this curve itself. Um, so each, each of the branch points is a branch point with uh, um, labeled by two sheets. And the foliation, the foliation with label ij around this branch point um, is going to be much the same as it was before. It has a kind of three-pronged singularity. And in particular, it has three distinguished trajectories um, which are going to be among our, our Stokes lines. Um, so there, these Stokes lines are going to be solutions of this equation where i and j are the particular i and j that met at this uh, covering, at this branch point. And now, it, of course, globally, I would have a problem of uh, um, trivializing this cover. So I'll write explicitly, I'll, you know, in drawing this picture, I'll put an actual branch cut. Then the Stokes lines, this one is labeled by ij, this one is ji, this one is ij again. So they alternate. And if you go through here, you cross a cut. Um, so OK, so that's going to be the local picture. Each branch point is going to emit three of these Stokes lines. And then there's one further thing. There's the further thing, which is at first surprising, is so now you emit these lines. And just like before, you let them just travel around the curve, do whatever they want to do. Um, but sometimes they're not any more leaves of a global foliation. So it may happen that they would actually cross each other. Um, and if they cross each other, if I, if I have an ij1 and a jk1 that intersect, um, then the rule is going to be that they should give birth to a new one. So here I have ij, here I have jk, and they cross each other. And in addition, we're going to generate a new line, um, a line of type uh, uh, ik. Um, so this is, in a sense, this is kind of an echo of something that occurred in the story of two-dimensional wall crossing a long time ago. It is essentially by that formula, exactly. So, so yeah, somehow in the, in the abelianization procedure, it's exactly this formula which, which is forcing you to give birth to these lines. Um, uh, but this had actually, recently we learned that this had actually been studied before. So people in WKB had noticed this phenomenon. Um, OK. Uh, so, so OK, so, so sorry. So, 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 so that's the definition of the spectral network. The spectral network is you just shoot these three lines out of each branch point, and then you let them do whatever they want to do. But when they cross, um, so you let them evolve according to this differential equation, but when they cross, you have to give birth to new ones. Um, and now, so here's an example of what this procedure might look like. So here I took, uh, um, 
I took the case of just a threefold cover. So this is a Higgs field on a rank three bundle. Um, and I took the curve to be, again, the only things I can plot really are take CP1. So here it's stereographic coordinates, but all this, and we put all the singularities. So it's a Higgs field with singularities, and the singularities are at those three blue dots. And I chose it so that the, the covering has a total of six branch points. Those are these six, uh, the six X's that you see here. Um, and what you see is that the thing, at least in this particular example, um, the behavior is, uh, it's defined by a priori, a, total, a totally crazy procedure. But at least here, the behavior is actually reasonably well under control. So the trajectories travel around. Um, when they collide, they can give birth to new trajectories. Um, but eventually, uh, uh, all the trajectories get attracted down to these uh, uh, singularities. Uh, this would be what switching system? The, the sphere with three mark points? Yeah. Uh, SL3. SL3. S it's, it, right, exactly. It's SL3, a sphere with three mark points, and with singularities of the most gener generic kind at those three points. So first order poles um, with generic eigenvalues at the three points. Um, uh, so, um, uh, so okay, so so um, um, so this, at, at least in this particular example, the behavior is a lot like what we had for the trajectories of quadratic differentials. Um, now, it's an unfortunate fact that not every example is is uh, um, is so well behaved. But at least there are some. In, so in general, it may be that this procedure defines for you actually a dense set of trajectories. Um, and in that case, we just have to we just have to live with that. Um, but at least there are there are many good examples in which it's really like what we had for the quadratic differentials. Um, so this is the object that we this is the object that you study. This is the object that gives rise to the um, to the to the Stokes phenomenon um, in this higher rank uh, um, in these higher rank examples. Um, okay. Um, so is it true that any trajectory is going to a pole? Uh, I think it's, I, I believe it is true. So as I say, there are really no theorems about this. Um, experimentally, I believe that it's true that if you have these, if you have the poles, um, that every trajectory will wind up at a pole. The problem is that they may collide many, many times with other guys on the way. They may give birth to new things, and you have sort of an infinite regress of these new things being created. We first thought that this can't happen, but it now seems that it, it actually does happen. Um, it does happen, but still, there's sort of open sets in parameter space where it doesn't, and so you may just consider those open sets as a way of getting started. Um, and there are some examples in which it never happens. There, there are some parameter spaces where it doesn't happen anywhere. Um, OK, so now, as before, just as before, um, we could study the solutions of Hitchin equations and the corresponding families of flat connections. And just as before, the asymptotics um, uh, are going to be controlled by a kind of abelianization. So uh, you express the monodromies of an SLK connection uh, downstairs um, in terms of some simpler quantities, which are whole nomies of an abelian connection uh, upstairs uh, over the spectral cover. In practice, we're solving now the same equation of the nabla s equals 0. Exactly. The connection is SL3. Yes. Three. SL3 or SLK, yeah. SL, SLK, SL3. Yeah. Right, we're we look on WKB. We're not solving it exactly. We want to look on WKB. Well, we are solving it exactly. I mean, the, the statements that we derive from this are exact statements. Um, I mean, the, the statement, this formula that expresses the monodromy in terms of the monodromies of an abelian connection, that's an exact formula. Um, uh, I mean, it's, it's, you derive that formula. You know, what leads you to consider that, that particular construction, the motivation is that you're interested in studying the WKB uh, asymptotics. Um, but, uh, but no, the, the point is that there really exist actual solutions that have those asymptotics. So the formula is an exact, the, this relation between the monodromy downstairs and the monodromy upstairs is an exact relation. Um, so, and then again, we have the same kind of story that we had in the, um, in the rank two case. Um, uh, when this network, so you have this network that gives you the, this network of Stokes lines um, controlling the zeta goes to zero asymptotics. Um, and when this network jumps, so now again, we can, we can ask, suppose I vary parameters, how does the network change? Um, and the network's topology may jump, and at that moment, these, these x gammas also jump. Um, but as before, the cool thing is you can study very generally what will be the form of that, uh, what will be the form of the jump. Um, and you find, just as in the rank two case, that they're always controlled by this, these kind of uh, transformations that appeared in the kinsevich Seubelman uh, formula. Um, it is the same k. It is the same k. Because, I mean, after all, uh, this k, as it was defined by Kinsevich and Seubelman, was just an automorphism of a torus. 
uh, so you know, a, a birational transformation of a torus. Um, uh, right now we have a k-fold cover, but again, we're just studying C star connections over that k-fold cover. So that's still a torus, just a torus uh, of larger dimension. Um, and so no, it, it, it's really exactly the same formal structure as there was in the case uh, of rank two connections. Um, uh, is there a way to understand this procedure? I mean, abelianization is a very uh, rough procedure. I mean, I, I would think that you would go from SLN to SLN minus one, SLN minus two. No, I'm, yeah. So. I'm sorry that I didn't include sort of more uh, about exactly how you, uh, uh, how you do this. I'm, I, I, I've said it in a slightly rough way, um, but it's an absolutely precise thing. I mean, it, it's. Uh, but I, I mean, is there a way just to simplify first? I mean, you have your SLK connection. So yeah. is there a way to construct a cover where you have SLK minus one connection? I mean, all the levies. That, that's of, what of, of all the parabolics. Okay, so there's something there's there's something like that that'll happen if you consider a, uh, if you consider a point of the Hitchin base which is very special. So like imagine that you consider like the case of uh, GL n n one n two, then you can reduce the thing to GL n one. What you have to do is consider some very special uh, uh, points of the Hitchin base where the spectral cover has kind of n one sheets together. Where it's a where it's a non-reduced thing that's like n one copies. So th then there is a kind of stepwise version of the thing. Um, uh, okay, so so uh, so now so the, the formal story is the, just exactly the same as it was before, um, except so now the the jumps that you get before I could totally classify what happened. The classification was you could have these saddle connections or these closed loops and nothing else. Um, now in this higher rank situation. Um, the classification of possible kind of topologies is somehow much, much more complicated. Um, so let me show you the first new thing. So here's a situation. This is again in rank uh, k equals 3. And I'm just studying this little cluster of three branch points. Um, and here we see the following thing happen. So right now, the topology jumps. Um, and so the, the new object that appeared at that critical moment uh, was an object that looks like this. So we've got these three branch points. Um, and at each of these branch points, some pair of sheets is coming together. So here it's the pair 1, 2. And it's emitting a 1, 2 trajectory. Um, at the next one, it's the pair 1, th uh, 2, 3. And at the last one, it's the pair 3, 1. And uh, there's some critical moment. The critical moment is the moment when these three trajectories come together at a common point, And they make this kind of three-string network. And that th three string network is the object that's kind of responsible for this jump in the topology. So now we're, you know, we're finding a new kind of invariance, the invariance that count these jumps. Um, this isn't the kind of object that contributes. Uh, this is a new kind of object that contributes to these invariants. Um, but that's not the only new kind of object. So once you, once you allow that topology, um, you have to allow much more general, well, sorry. <laughs> You just study this thing and you see what you get. Um, but it doesn't include just that. Um, it includes, you know, certainly you could, have a, you could have a more general kind of tree. You could have something like this. You could have something with five vertices. You could have something where you, um, uh, uh, you could some, have something where you attach a loop to it. Um, at this moment, I can't remember how to, oh yeah. So you could have something where you attach a loop to it. Like this, um, there's there's sort of arbitrarily complicated structure in this problem, um, but it seems to be just forced on you. I mean, if you want to study the SLK version of this story, that's what the story is. Um, uh, and so, in in particular, let me show you one particularly sort of crazy thing. Um, oh yeah, so this is the sorry, this is the picture that I just drew. So here's the this is the sort of before and after picture of this uh, spectral network. Um, and so this one, if you work it up, by the way, this one contributes just one uh, invariant omega equals one. So it's really just like the saddle connections. Um, but in so in general, you get uh, sort of much much more crazy things. So here's a sort of exotic thing which happens already for k equals in the SL three story. So this picture is drawn on the cylinder. So you should identify the left and right sides. Um, you can have a combination of trajectories which uh, um, which looks like this. So this is the locus along which the trajectories are kind of hitting each other head to head. Um, and in this case, you go away and you calculate the, uh, um, you know, there's a procedure for calculating the jump of the abelianization map. Um, and you, uh, you just calculate it in this case. And what you find is that 
it is indeed given in this same formula, you know, k gamma to the power omega of gamma. But now it contributes not just to omega of gamma. So here, corresponding to this picture, there's some homology class, which you get, again, by lifting these trajectories to the spectral curve. And what you get here is invariance not just for that homology class, but also for all the multiples of that homology class, um, uh, which are exponentially growing. So, so the story in this higher rank uh, uh, case um, seems, to be, uh, seems to be somehow much more intricate and, and, and much less explored. Um, Nevertheless, uh, you know, the same sort of formal story that I told you for proving the wall crossing formula works equally well in this situation. And so this thing, in fact, that's how we extract these invariants. Um, uh, and so the, the wall crossing behavior of these new numbers is still completely captured by this wall crossing formula. So in particular, this sort of complicated sequence of invariants that I, that I just showed you a slide ago um, also could have been derived um, in principle just from the, from the wall crossing formula. So here, um, it's wall crossing between two things that have uh, inner product three. Um, uh, so you have two things, call them gamma one and gamma two. You consider this product of this simple product of transformations, and now you try to rewrite it as a product in the opposite order, um, and you find an incredibly complicated thing. But in particular, in the middle of that thing, so there's a lot, bunch of dots here for things that I'm not uh, writing. But in the middle of that thing, um, you find this product. Um, of transformations with, with uh, exactly these uh, coefficients. Um, so there's some, there's some new counting problem here, um, which is still part of this whole you know, Donaldson-Thomas invariant structure, um, uh, but which, gives, you know, which is able to give you sort of fairly complicated stuff. Um, OK. Um, so OK, so let me just sum up. So, so I told you in the beginning what this wall crossing phenomenon is, sort of where it came from in physics. Um, I didn't tell you much. And, and then, uh, and then I, I described some particular examples. You know, for a particular physical theory, um, the whole story becomes very geometric. Um, and so we studied wall crossing for the special trajectories of quadratic differentials. Um, and then more generally for, uh, for the degenerations of these new objects, which we're calling spectral networks. Um, so they both come from, they, they both come sort of equally naturally from quantum field theory. Um, and so in, e in each case, you know, one way to think about the objects which you're trying to count is they have something to do with the, the asymptotics of the monodromy uh, for this system of linear differential equations with a small parameter. Um, and from that point of view, the wall crossing formula, you know, once you sort of absorb this, this way of thinking about the story, the wall crossing formula becomes something which is actually just automatic. It's sort of a consistency condition for the whole story to work. Um, so the, so the, as I said, the, the special trajectories of quadratic differentials are a kind of well-studied subject, although I think the statement that they have this wall crossing phenomena, um, the, the statement that they obey the wall crossing formula hadn't been noticed uh, before. Um, so now that story is somehow connected to this theory of Donaldson-Thomas invariance. Um, and then there's this new theory for higher rank about which essentially almost nothing is known so far, which I sort of hope to advertise a little bit as an interesting thing. Okay, that's it, so thank you. Uh, I would have many comments, but let me just begin with the last one, that in fact the Japanese school of exact WKB theory have studied this uh, uh, higher K problem quite a lot. Oh, uh, okay, great. So, so, uh, I knew that they've, OK, so oh, great. So, so I don't understand completely what they, what they get, but they, there exists a vol voluminous literature. Great. So then correct this. So, so I, so far, don't know very much. Um, and by connecting with these guys, perhaps I learned something. Uh, yeah, thank you. Hey, I, after I, I think more about other questions. Any clue what is this omega in the equation of quantization of pitch in the system? Um, so far, I don't understand the relation between this story. But it's very similar what you are doing. You are almost quantizing the pitch in the system. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, um, so yeah, no doubt these things have some role to play in the story of the quantization. Um, but so far, I don't know what it is. 
Okay, I have another question then. In WKB theory, you have a small parameter. Right. But it's not clear, you have a symmetry between zero and infinity in this data, and it's not clear how it connects to general WKB theory. Right, okay, that is a great question. So, so I mean, the things that arose for us in physics um, kind of automatically came in this very particular form, these very particular families that have the symmetry between zero and infinity. Now, of course, the, the structures that we find look a lot like the structures that people in WKB have studied before, and there they study it without that restriction. Um, so, so I don't know whether, I mean, here I was describing a pretty detailed thing about, you know, precise formulas for the asymptotics of the, uh, of the monodromy. Um, I don't know, so the proof that the, so we gave an argument for why these local solutions exist. Um, and in that argument, we used the fact that, it, that the thing has this symmetry. So it's a priori possible that, our, that the results that I told you really only hold for the special class of things that come from Hitchin systems. Um, or it might be that it works for every family. I, I just don't know. But d does the abelianization map depend on the fact that it has, is this special form? Or? Well, no, the abelianization thing is a totally general thing which you can do as soon as someone gives you a spectral network um, and as soon as, as soon as someone gives you a... Uh, now, would, it, would, would that be the same? Would you get the same thing if you used any... Uh, any complex that we could be a problem was the same. Um, yeah, I think. I mean, you could formulate that. You could formulate that whole procedure. You could indeed formulate that whole procedure without the structure at infinity. Um, uh, but do, would you get the same? Uh, the viewing addition map would it be the same map? It, it, it would be the. It would be the same map. Yeah. Um, but you have the sign. Sigma, which was minus oh. in your case, <laughs> yeah, and, yes. and in general it is not, no? Uh, the sign, no, we've worked out that sign. So that, I mean, that sign ultimately has to do with a tricky thing in WKB. So I, 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 I told you that uh, um, when you have a flat connection, you abelianize it by a flat connection over the, over the spectral cover. But actually, yeah, I should have said, so the most canonical thing to get is not exactly a flat connection over the spectral cover. What it rather is is a flat connection which has holonomy minus one around the, uh, the, the branch points. So it, I mean, it's, it, the set of those things is a torsor over the set of flat connections, but it has this little minus one. Now, in many examples, you're able to avoid that, you're able to get rid of that sign. Um, but the process of getting rid of that sign introduces this sigma gamma somewhere else. Um, so you can either work with these twisted, these sort of twisted flat connections, the flat connections which have this minus one everywhere, and then everything is totally canonical. Yeah, exactly. So in WKB, this is known. This is a well-known thing, uh, but it, it occurs generally in this abelianization process. Even if you don't think about it as WKB, that sign is just in there. Um, if you want to get rid of that sign and just deal with ordinary flat connections, you can do it. But the price you pay is this little sigma gamma. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. One more comment, please. Uh, you, you started by saying that all all of this was a sort of an annoying detail. Ah, uh, yes. Uh, in a way, in a way, I can. I, I completely agree with you that for uh, uh, second order differential equations, indeed, it can by be bypassed. Uh, so there's a more, more efficient way of, of completely avoiding uh, this, uh, all this, uh, the, this whole scheme. So I wonder, perhaps, in your problem, it might also help. I, I, yeah, I don't know. I mean, our interest in these structures was, of course, uh, you know, partly motivated by WKBU, but partly not. Uh, um, uh, so yeah, if it turns out that this stuff is not necessary for WKB, I mean that that's okay with me. Uh, <laughs> uh, but uh, <laughs> uh. Yeah. if you do the higher genus stream, instead of starting CP one, let's say it takes the torus. Yeah. With one marked point or something. Yeah. People know that there are relations. I mean, in some other quantization of features, there is a relation between torus with one marked point and a sphere with four four four. Do you see those things here? Or you don't study the higher genius case? Um, the higher genius case, um, we've done a little bit. I mean, we certainly did study that particular case of a torus with one puncture um, for SL2. Do you see that the, somehow the, the problem is the same as the sphere with four marked points? Um, well, there's some relation. I mean, it, in, in the limit where you take the residues to be some specific residues for the, for the sphere with four punctures. Well, I mean, just, um, just the regular, uh, regular singularity. Um, yeah, you take you take regular singularities for both, but then I think you have to impose some further relation before they become the same. I mean, th th okay, there's one thing that I know, which is that the moduli of flat connections of SL2C flat connections on the four punctured sphere 
is, if you write it concretely, it's like an affine cubic surface. Um, but you, more precisely, if you fix the eigenvalues of monodromy around the four points, you yeah, can. You have to fix, uh, there is some restriction on there, but you know, right. re re recalculate. So this is a relation between equal to star n f equal 4. Yes. Um, Right, if you put that, if you put some restriction on the, um, so then the affine cubic surface, I mean, for the, for the torus with one puncture, there's also an affine cubic surface with some special parameter. So in that sense, the moduli spaces are the same. I haven't thought about whether the abelianization procedure is also the same, although I guess it probably is. Um, Uh, sometimes it is possible to refine WKB by some non-perturbative corrections. Uh, can you comment? Um, I mean, I think in a sense, uh, in a sense, the, the the Stokes lines that we're drawing uh, are exactly the kind of non-perturbative corrections that you need. Uh, um, I mean, I, I don't have a, I don't have a direct comment, but but. Uh, um, uh, I mean, the formulas that we write ultimately are sort of non-perturbative formulas. And for example, so maybe one thing to say is that, for example, here's an example of a kind of non-perturbative correction. Um, so, so I'm writing here. A, we're writing here a formula for the for the trace of the whole nomy around some loop. Now, this for, this formula, um, this formula is actually an exact formula. So it's an expansion of the trace in terms of these simpler objects, which are the holonomies of this abelian connection. Now, if you like, you might say the leading term in that, so there's, for any particular uh, quadratic differential, or for any particular point of the Hitchin base, there's going to be the leading term, which is the one where the real part of this is the biggest. Um, and then if you like, you might say that the other terms, the subleading terms, which are coming from other loops on the spectral curve, are kind of non-perturbative corrections to that one. So maybe that's sort of morally the... In this case, you don't have divergent series. Uh, no, no. Even in this case, I mean, the, the <clears throat> I mean, well, the, the WKB series for this, for the, for the sections, or even for these functions x gamma of zeta. I mean, those functions x gamma of zeta. If you expand them around zero, they have no, no. They, they're not given by convergent series. This is really asymptotics. It's not a yeah. yeah but uh, I think this is just an unfortunate point of history that WKB theory started as asymptotics with divergent series. In fact, it's an exact theory. Oh, yeah. okay. So I fully sympathize with that point of view. Uh, um, uh, I mean, here these are these are certainly supposed to be exact formulas. But 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 I mean, it's it's true that if you expand them around z equals zero, which is an interesting thing to do, you do find this divergent series. <laughs>